we're going to start off, I'll go through the Pi solution in some detail. Um, and then we'll talk about normal document. It's the same format as yesterday, uh, four hour and a half blocks for the lecture followed by a practical. Uh, but this morning going to be slightly different than I'm actually going to um, uh, going to go through the um, uh, the exercise. Um, so I need to get the uh, I'll, I'll just get the uh, example from the um, from from the GitHub. It's the there's a uh, you'll see in the exercises that there is a, um, um, uh, a detailed solution to Pi example. Now, as I said, somewhat annoyingly uh, on GitHub, if you w get, um, you have to replace blob with raw for reasons which have been explained to me. Um, so now I have the, uh, I think it's called MPP tie. So what I'll do, oops, is I'll go through uh, the um, Fortran examples first, actually, because there seems to be more Fortran programs here. So let's go to the Fortran example. Uh, the Pi serial code is just, oh, sorry. My typing is very bad. Um, is just, you know, just checking that my cursor is appearing here. Yes. Um, so we set n equals 840. I have pi and exact pi, exact, and I just say pi is naught, and then I sum up um, using the uh, the loop. Uh, that's basically it. And then I multiply by 4 over n, and the exact value of pi is, is you can compute with 4 times arctan of 1. And if I just, so that's just the serial code, and if I just run it, We'll see that we uh, we get an error of you know one part in a million to three few parts, which is quite surprising given that it's such a um, such a naive expansion. But that's quite interesting. So let's look at the parallel code. So um, it starts off as fairly normal. Now this is the Fortran 90 version. I will look at the Fortran 2 there. Now for the C programs, I'll do the C version afterwards. But the logic it, it's all the same. It's just a bit of syntax which is different. Um, so uh, I use MPI, I, I do exactly the same stuff as before. Now I have some MPI variables. So I have my normal com rank size, source tag I error, and I have my status, which is a, a, an array in, uh, in the Fortran 90 uh, interface. And a few other local variables. So the important point about parallelizing the pi calculation is that you don't loop from one to n, you loop from um, a, a, a range. And the easiest thing to do is just have variables here. You have I start and I stop, okay? So in, this, in, this, in the serial program, I start was one and I stop was n, but we're going to um, we're going to vary them. And I have a partial pi and a receive pi, I need some temporaries for the message passing. And I have a right here, computing approximation to pi using n equals n. That's just again to re-emphasize, that's before MPI init, so you will get multiple copies of that right. So again, just to re-emphasize, MPI init does not spawn the parallel processes. The parallel processes are running beforehand. It gets them together. Now, on a standard com size, com rank, a bit of a hello. And you should always do this. You should always say running on so many, I, I, you know, you should put a bit of debug in your programs. We'll come back to this later, but it is just a useful debug to know what's going on. So I have a partial pi, and now I have to, um, 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 enough to uh, divide up the, the loop space. And so my loop, just to go jump ahead, the loop is exactly the same, exactly the same, except I do from I start to I stop, okay? So this is single program, multiple data, okay? This is, the, the all the processes are running this program. All the processes are running this same um, uh, piece of code, single program. The multiple data is they all have their own I start and I stop. And if we set the I start and I stop differently, then they will do different things. And of course, if we set the I start and the I stop based on the rank, then that's different. So I just split the loop space up into um, bunches of N over size. 
and these are so it's n over size times rank and because i'm four well not because i'm four trans because i need to start from one i add one here and i stop is that uh, i start plus n over size minus one now this won't work of course if um n is not divisible by size but that's a, a small thing here and a little we'll come back to debugging but a little tip you know people sometimes they'll run the code and they get the wrong answer and it might be because their eye start and i stop are wrong and I've seen people stare at the screen for hours to try and work out, you know, wh which what just print them out. And so when you print, just print them out and you will see if they're correct. OK, um, so but also whenever you do a print statement, you should prepend it with the rank. Otherwise, you'll say I start equals seven, I stop equals 53. You've no idea who, where they're from. So you have to get into the, the habit in MPI programs of a debug messages you have to make sure only appear on one process, say rank what zero. But any debug messages which are process dependent, like these variable, these loop limits, you should print out the rank. So that but that's basically okay. So now I'm printing out the partial value. Now okay. Compute global value of pi by sending pi to five to rank zero. I mentioned this yesterday. This would be more efficiently done using MPI reduce, but it's it, it's a uh, it's um it's just an example. So let's jump. So again single program multiple data all the processes execute this code but it just turns out that only one of them goes into this branch okay so this branch is the right let's do the other part okay so everyone else uh, says okay I'm rank rank sending to rank zero I've got a variable called tag um, just just so I can di differentiate um, the, the, the zero is the sort so I MPI s send the partial pi value which is one MPI double precision to zero tag com i error so everyone bar so we have n minus one processes in this branch so there are n minus one sends so to receive them so um you know mpi works on matching messages a message is sent or received in its entirety so if we have a uh, n minus one messages coming in we have to issue n minus one separate receive there's no concept in mpi of a well a persist there is something in MPI called a persistent receive it's not what you think it is you have to actually you know they, they these are not open open mailboxes they are you know you 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 put your hand out you receive a message and you and you, you finish so i have to do explicit loop do source equals one to size minus one okay Receive partial pi. Now I'm going to receive from any source just to make it a more general program. So I'm going to receive one MPI double position from any source into my receive pi tag com status i error. And the reason I used any source is I want to say, well, rank zero is receiving from rank. Who did I receive from? Actually, here I don't really care who I received from, but in a real program, I would care because I would want to get back. To, but here I'm just saying I've received from, and it's in this, this entry in the um, array. And then I just add it up. So it's relatively simple. Um, and in my mind, I actually think of the send. Uh, I think of the send sort of going between the if blocks. I think of that send. The confusing thing is it is quite conceptually confusing because you've written one piece of source code, but at runtime, if you run it on 100 processes, this code is executed 99 times and this code is executed once. And that works, but it, it can be slightly confusing. Okay. So let's run it. Uh, no, I didn't mean to change it. So let's, uh, did I have a make file? I did, that's very good of me. Ah, okay. The reason that it didn't work is that the make file uh, was for um, Archer. So let's just, okay, I have no idea. Yes, so uh, Laurent says it would be safer if the tag, it's actually funny actually, just as I was looking at the code, I actually thought that was a bit poor. So uh, you're absolutely right. It would be better um, if um, if if the tag was a global tag. I think I I think I have the tag in here because in one of the versions I tagged the um, I tagged the message with the rank. So this was tag equals rank, and this was tag equals source. I think that it's a, it's a historical artifact. Uh, but you're absolutely right that is a dangerous way to code so i should have if i'm not using tags i should actually have a global value called default tag or, or tag or something that's a good point yeah okay um so if i make now oh i didn't change the because i'm i'm very sorry 
I'm not really messing this up. I want to look at the make file. Uh, so, okay, yeah. So uh, on Archer, the, the Fortran compiler is called uh, FTN, but on Cirrus, it's called okay. So I make, okay. So if I MPI run, you should always check your program works on one process, okay? The number of times people say, my program doesn't work, and they try and debug it on 100 processes, and you say, well, just run it on one, okay? And that works, so we get the same answer. Uh, and there's no sends or receives because um, because uh, the loop was a null loop and nobody entered the the the, the rank not equal to zero branch. But at least it works. I start is one nice office. That's good. Let's run on four. I'll I'll clear the screen. I'll clear the screen and run on four. So. Uh, just to say, we get these four print statements, uh, everyone prints, and we get hello, we get a hello statement, and then we get a bit of a mess because, as I said uh, yesterday, the output from any one process comes out in order, so it is an order, but the output from two processes merged in, um, in, in a random, non-reproducible way. Um, but um, if you look, um, rank, so, so if you look at the, 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 the the loop limits, they're correct. They're 1, 2, 10, 2, 11, 4, 20, 4, 21, 6, 30, 6, 31, 8, 40, so we're all okay. And um, we, 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 add, we add it up and um, we get, we get, the, uh, yeah, we get the, the, um, the, the value. And you'll see here that rank zero received from rank one, two, and three in that order. Now, there was no reason it had to receive in that order because I did MPI any source. So, I mean, it might just be on my laptop. That's what happens. But, you know, there is no guarantee of that. Uh, what I would like to is just look at, um, if I run it on one, if you look, okay, the answers on one and four processes are very slightly different, okay? So why is that? They're almost the same, but they're very slightly different. Five eight nine five five eight seven three. Yes, yeah, point operations. I, I have I have taken this series from one to n, yeah. And in the first serial example, I've added up one to n. In the second parallel example, I've added up in four chunks, then added them together. And floating point operations are not associative. Yeah. So so now some people now throw their hands up in horror and think the world has end ended, but this answer is equally wrong, okay? Why did I add from one to n? I could have added from n to one. I could in the serial program have split it into four, four pieces and added them together at the end. They're all slightly different. They're all slightly different. This is floating point numbers. This is the real world. If you do an experiment in the real world, you don't get the same answer. So this is not a problem, okay? This really is not a problem because even the serial answer isn't, isn't the golden standard. That's not the right answer. I could have got n. The serial code could have been written in a semi-infinite number of ways. So However, what is a problem potentially is if I run the program again, you'll see that actually it received them in a different order here. Okay, now it was rank three to three one two, and that means that we can actually add them up in a different order on, on the master. So we could get a dip. So I'll, I'll have to I'll have to run on a lot of processes to show that. That's what I now remember. My my um my laptop only has four cores, but I can run twenty processes on it. Okay. And I'll actually, um, I'll grep out the, um, um, the, the, the answer at the end, okay? So there's the error there, okay? Now you'll see I've got a different answer, yeah? I ran the same program twice and I got different answers. So that is because the first time I added the sub sums up in one order and the second time I did it in a different order because I was using MPI any source. And that is a problem, okay? Because if you get a different answer when you run the same executable and the same number of processes twice in a row, that that probably possible to debug because there is no gold standard answer for this particular program on this number of processes. So how could I fix that? I mean, there was a an issue there. How could I how could I add them up in the same order? So uh, Lawrence is key. Oh, yes. So, so the trick is, is oops, I'm not looking at that. Uh, the trick is to um, uh, when I do the receive, okay, 
not to do MPI any source, yeah, but to do to receive. So in this version with MPI any source, this is just a counting loop. Source is one to size minus one is actually slightly um, slightly uh, disingenuous, slightly misleading. It's just saying I'm going to do size minus one receives, okay? But I could actually put source in here. That guarantees that I will receive in order. And if I run now, I'll get the same answer every time. And in fact, if I do, uh, you'll see, you'll see, of course, that rank zero receives them in the correct order, because by definition, I'm doing it in that order. Uh, again, this isn't the gold standard, but it's just, it, you need to have, rep now actually there is a way, now again, I keep saying the real way to do this reduction at the end would be called a reduction operation. There's a disadvantage with this, with this approach though, because I'm, I'm mandating I receive from process one first, but maybe process 20 is already, uh, 19 is already to send. And so, you know, I should, so how, can anyone think of a way where I could um, have the best of both worlds? I could have the efficiency, potential efficiency of receiving with MPI any source, but have a reproducible, um, have a reproducible uh, answer. Yes, exactly, use an array. So what I would do is I would declare, declare, declare an array of size, size minus one or size. And when I receive, I stick it into the, if, it's, if I receive from rank five, I stick it into position five. If I receive from rank three, I stick it into position three, and I just add them up at the end. So that's that. that. Now again, these are just sort of thought experiments. In reality, we reduce MPI reduce here. Uh, I think another thing which is maybe nice is um, if I, this is, I'm doing this sort of live, so um, yes, but if I change the number of processes, the result would be different, absolutely. But there, there is no correct result. Just two people could have got different results writing the same serial program because they could have cho chosen to loop from one to n or n to one. But you're absolutely right. Well, let's, if I change the result, that's a good, um, if I run on 20, I get that. If I run on uh, 40, I get that, slightly different. Okay. Tiny differences. You can tell it's rounding error in the 16th decimal place or whatever it is. That is, a, you know, that is the limit of double precision. Um, you're absolutely right, but um, that's just that's just computational science. There's no, there's no nothing to worry about there. Um, what I did, I think, which is never useful. One of the nice things about running, so I'm going to have to get rid of the uh, get of all the the, the 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 right statements here because it's going to. I'll get rid of all of them, actually. Um, so what I'm going to do, let's just check that I, I did that. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. No, I didn't get rid of all the rights. So what I'm going to do is actually put this in a loop. So I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to put this into a loop into say integer i loop, okay? And let's just say something like, uh, do, what did I call it? Loop 10,000 say. And then I'll do and do it down here. If I make that's maybe a bad idea running on forty, that's run on four. Maybe that was a bit too many, but um but it's so so okay so that, so so what why I'm doing this is actually there is a reason I'm doing this is that I could actually um, show you now what I'm going to have to do to do this is to share my entire screen which I don't like doing um, because you can potentially see all my uh, email and stuff but if I maybe actually do that okay so let's go back to that and share content.
Um, so I was actually had an awful, I'm going to have to go off this window, aren't I? Because I'm going to, uh, uh, right. So, um, so if I now can, um, can you still, can someone speak, can you still see everything? I've had to, to, to get rid of my collaborate window because otherwise you get this infinite regression. Uh, I'll just do a double check. I'm still online. Am I? Yep, fine. Okay, sorry about that. I just, just I don't want to get that kind of infinite regression. Good. So let's let's just try again. Now, actually, the reason <laughs> the reason that uh, reason it took a, a macroscopic time before was actually because I, I I had actually uh, um, had millions of processes running because I. Uh, so let's just try again. So one more, let's put another zero in and that will be due. So there is a point to this, apologies for all the messing about. What I want to do is I want to do, uh, system monitor. So what I've got here, what's one of the nice things about uh, running on your laptop is that you can, uh, you can look at the CPU history, okay? So here, I, you can look at my CPU history here, what's going on. I mean, yeah, laptops do an awful lot of stuff which you don't want them to do, but they're, you know, it's buzzing along at not much CPU. And if I run this on one process, you should suddenly see um, that bang, there's one process suddenly hammering away at 100%. So only, so you can see that one, it says I've got eight processes, that's with hyper threads, I've really only got four. And you can see that that process is hammering away at a very, very high rate. And then eventually, this might take quite a while to run, of course, it will um, it will come back down again. OK, and we'll see it drop back down again when the, uh, it's a bit of a lag. OK, fine. Let's do it on two. We can see, we should see two of them bang up. There we go. There they are. Yeah, there's two. There's a, they're over each other, but there's a, an orange and a, and a, and a reddy one uh, running away. And we should see that it runs quicker. Maybe that will come back down more quickly. Maybe it will run on. Yeah, they, it, ah, now you'll see what it did there. The operating system decided in its in its infinite wisdom, oh, it's done it again, to, to swap processes around. So that, you know, that's this is just a general purpose uh, Linux operate, Ubuntu operating system. How much did I pay for it? Nothing, I found it on the web. Uh, and you can, that's quite interesting there. You know, it's actually swapping the processes around. I think that's quite interesting to see. Uh, another thing you can do is maybe run on four and we'll see the whole lot bang up again. We'll see them all go. Um, and I think the other thing which is worth showing is um, if I do a top, which is a process thing on Linux, on Linux, you'll see as far as the operating system is, 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 is concerned, it's just running four programs called Pi Parallel. And it happens to be running them all at almost 100%. But the operating system has no idea this is a parallel program. It just thinks it's running four programs called Pi Parallel and it's finished now. Okay. So I think that's, you know, Playing around, I think that's quite interesting um, um, to see how it works on your laptop, and that's something you can only really do uh, when you're um, when you're um, when you're running on a on a single machine. So um, I want to. Oops, oh, I've done the wrong thing. So. Uh, why are the processes swapping around? Well, of course, you know, if you if uh, if I run top here, uh, you you see that. Yeah. So, it's run, my, my my machine is running thousands of processes, and if so so to get them, the operating system always has to shuffle processes around. Yeah, so maybe it descheduled a couple of the MPI processes momentarily. You didn't see it, and and then when it rescheduled them, it put them somewhere else. I mean, it looks like they're running all the time. It's not running all the time, you know, because. You know, they're, they're actually, it's like an animation. It's, it, it, it's, it's, it's shuffling, you know. I only have four, well, let's say, I only have four physical cores here. This process program can only, this computer can only do four things at once. The fact that it appears to be doing millions of things at once or thousands of things is just an illusion. It shuffles things around. Uh, but yes, it's a bit dumb. But you would hope on the dedicated high performance computer like, um, uh, next gen IO or Cirrus, that that wouldn't happen. And, 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 and on, on dedicated systems, the processes tend to be pinned, or at least there's a greater affinity, you know, that it doesn't swap them around. 
but yeah, I mean, you know, why is it swapping process around? Because maybe Linux is a bit rubbish. Um, well, it, that's a good point, but it wasn't running on all the cores. That, that is a good point that it, it might have been trying to find, but actually there are only four physical cores here. So hopefully the operating system is clever enough to know that, that, that when it schedules the four processes, it puts them on the four physical cores, not two of them each on, on the stupid hyper threads, which are useless on. So um, uh, if the operating system, well, because, because the MPI pod world is not created by the operating system, the MPI com world is created by the MPI init subroutine. So the MPI init function goes away and finds out how many processes there are and basically um, get them together. So it's a software thing. Yeah, that's it. So, so again, remember MPI, MPI does not talk about cores. Nowhere in MPI when we hear it talk about physical cores. It talks about processes, okay? So that's all MPI talks about, processes talking to each other. You hope your operating system is clever enough that it will schedule those processes efficiently. But MPI does not talk about cores anywhere. It's talking about processes. I could be running in the in the 90s. I would have, could have run these 20 processes on a single physical core. Um, in fact, of course, if you see, if I run on um, uh, um, anyway, I don't want to over overplay it, but I think it is interesting to do that. So let's go back and um, let's look at the C version now. I'll just go go through it very simply. It's exactly the same. Uh, we include mpi.h. I do a hash define because I'm old fashioned. And of course, in C, these the com and the status are are, are, are type defs, which is actually quite nice. MPI com comment. So there's much more type checking in C. In, in the old Fortran interface, the Fortran, well, I say the Fortran 90 interface, everything's an integer. And it's all exactly the same. Uh, MPI init null, exactly the same. The only differences are, let's go down here. Um, I can get it all onto the screen at once, which I'm not very good at. Right, the only difference is when I um, want to print out the source, it's status.mpi source, because status is um, an array, uh, sorry, it's a structure, and the source is status.mpi source. But as far as it goes, that is, this, this is, uh, and I have to be careful when I do the send and the receive, I do um, uh, 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 the, I, I do an ampersand, but if you got that wrong, it, it would complain. Yeah. So if I if I if I took out that ampersand, it would complain. Uh, oh, because I have uh, make five is wrong again. There. Okay. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm still, I'm getting this all wrong, aren't I? Right. There we go. So yeah, it says, it, so, so, that, so that, that's the big problem with the Fortran interface. You can put any rubbish in the Fortran interface and it won't notice because there's no, because there are no prototypes or, or it's a subtle, there are limited prototypes for the, um, for the Fortran version. For example, if I go to the Fortran version here, uh, if I, if I look at this may not, it, it very much depends on the system, but if I if I get the um, let's do the MPI S send here. If I miss off the I error, which is a really naughty thing to do, okay, and I make okay, so it picked it up. It's not so so that it did pick it up there. Um, that doesn't always happen, but anyway, um, if, if the Fortran 2008 version. I, so I haven't gone through it in detail, but if you're uh, I pr provided one here, okay. To do Fortran 2000, in Fortran 2008 version, you use MPI F08, so it, it, it's a different uh, module you use, okay? And it's exactly the same as the C interface. So in the C interface, we did MPI COM COM, MPI status status. In the Fortran, we do type MPI COM COM, type MPI status status. So actually, you know, it's, if you want to know how to do the Fortran 2008 version, just copy the C version. It's really quite nice. I'll come back to this stuff later on. And you'll see the only other difference is I've missed off, if I look at the main loop, which I can try and get onto the screen, or at least the computational loop, uh, the, the, there we go. I've missed off the I errors here because the function is overloaded. So if you don't provide the I error, it doesn't care. It, it, it deals with it properly, so that's good. Um, and um, the again, because uh, the 
uh, status is now um, a, a derived type. So instead of status dot MPI source, it's status percent MPI source. So actually, the Fortran 2008 interface looks almost identical to the to the C interface, which is why I've, you know, I, you just copy it if you want. The only other thing that um, might be an issue is we have um, a Fortran has a very very sophisticated type system, and so for example, okay, technically, um, you know. Real kind equals eight. That's it's not actually. I, it's a subtlety. I'm not a Fortran expert, but but you know, it's not guaranteed that that will be a an MPI double precision. Okay, it's just saying give me a variable. Which I mean, it's, it's a subtlety for it, but there's a very sophisticated type system. So how do you guarantee? So you have to guess. Mm, real kind equals eight. That's probably MPI double precision. And that's not very satisfactory. So what is the, the the only thing which is a bit weird? Well which is particularly different than the four time 2008 interface, I just illustrated here with an example, is that there was an inquiry function. So what you can say here is, okay, this is what you do. You say, okay, um, uh, pi is one of my, uh, is a real of kind equals eight. How do I get an NPI data type which matches the Fortran data type? Well, the, the clean way to do it is you do NPI size of pi, which gives you how big the pi variable is. And then you say NPI type match size. It says it's a bit strange syntax, but I've got a real variable, and this is how big it is, and give me back an MPI real type. And if you look at the top, MPI real type is of type MPI data type. So MPI double precision, MPI real, MPI are all of type MPI data type, but I can have a variable MPI real type. Which so this is just a semi-sophisticated way of saying to MPI at runtime. I've got this variable pi. Could you make sure that you give me an MPI type? I call it MPI real type, which matches the definition. And, and, and that's, that's just a slight subtlety there. But the main thing is just that you use these. Um, it's just, just copy the C interface. Miss off the I error and do this stuff here. Okay. So is that, um, is that clear? So I think that simple program illustrates quite a large number of things. And that's why most of the solutions are pretty, pretty terse. But I've given a very, verbo very verbose solution to the pi example because I think it illustrates a quite a large class of, of, um, of issues. So if there aren't any um, uh, more questions, then I will go on to the, the next lecture. Um, so we're going to talk about non-blocking communications. Okay. Um, Hopefully I have fixed a problem I had yesterday, whereas now we shouldn't have this. Yeah, we don't have this nasty decoration of the window. So that's um, so, so non-blocking communications are really very important uh, because they are the correct way to um, avoid deadlock. OK. So. Okay, so we saw uh, yesterday that in a very simple example, like the pi example, um, you could get deadlock um, but when you tried to do something as simple as send data around in a ring. Okay, so here we have that. Um, the numbering is a bit strange here, but but we saw that if you if you had um, processes arranged in a logical ring, and you tried to communicate, then um, it was very difficult to avoid deadlock with synchronous send. And the only way to do it was to do complicated things of pairing up processes. But in general, and it turns out this communication pattern, uh, which I introduced in the um, uh, traffic model, is actually a very, very common communication pattern when you do boundary swapping. In, 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 and we'll do that as one of the examples uh, next week. Um, so th the exercise is actually going to be to implement this pattern of communication, have a ring of processes, and everyone communicates with their neighbor. So we've talked about the mode of an operation. So the mode of a, so this, is, this becomes slightly subtle, so you maybe need to pay, pay attention. And the mode of an operation of a communication determines when its constituent operation is complete. This is a formal definition, okay? So synchronous completes when the message has been delivered. Asynchronous completes as soon as the message has been in the network or copied, okay? Analogous to um, making a phone call, posting a letter, or sending an email. However, MPI also has a definition called the form. The form of an operation determines when the procedure implementing that operation will return. 
when controlled is returned to the user program. So normally when you call a function, you expect it not to return control to you until it's finished. If you call the square root function, you expect that when you, it returns to you, it's, you know, you, it's finished the operation. But there are many places where that's not sensible. So for example, if I want to write a 100 gigabyte file, I do my, you know, call a function to write the file. Actually, I'd quite like to do some computation, thank you very much. It would actually be quite nice if that function returned control to me immediately and the file was written in the background and then later on I could say, okay, I can't go any further. Could you tell me if the file has been written yet? Now you may have called that, heard that called something like asynchronous IO. It's slightly confusing, but MPI calls that the form and MPI calls it blocking or non-blocking, okay? So a blocking operation re relate to when the operation is completed. It only returns from the subroutine call when the operation has completed. And that's a standard subroutine call. So these are what routines you've used so far. MPI S send returns when the message has been delivered. MPI receive returns when the message has been, a message has been received. However, MPI has the concept of non-blocking operations. And what they do is they return straight away and allow the subprogram to continue to perform other work. So in the example here of the sending the fax, in the original example, I put the fax in the machine and I stood there until that message went beep. What I do in non-blocking communications is I split the, 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 the communication to two phases, initiation and completion. So I say, you know, I start sending the, the, the fax, okay? Then I go away and I do something else like pull a lever and come back later and wait for it to complete with a beep, okay? So, so a non-blocking operation in MPI terminology returns control to you immediately and something goes on in the background and you have to come back later on and check whether it's completed. Now there's nothing magic about non-blocking operations, okay? But because they split initiation and completion into two phases, you can do other stuff in the middle. Now what people normally think about is what's illustrated here. I can do other work while the communication is going on. In fact, the most the biggest utility of non-blocking operations is you can do non-blocking communications here. So the problem with blocking communications and particularly synchronous send is you can only have one at any one time. To avoid deadlock, you want to have a send and a receive operation at the same time. But the problem is if you use synchronous send or the normal receive, you can only have one operation at once, okay? so. With non-blocking operations, you can have multiple outstanding sends and receives going on at the same time. And that allows you to, 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 to um, avoid deadlock. You can have the send and the receive going on at the same time. But it's up to you to arrange that. It's up to you to make sure that if you do a non-blocking send here, that you use the opportunity to do a, something else in the, a new communication in the middle. So all non-blocking operations should have matching re weight operations will see that you have to come back and wait. Okay, a common mistake is to initiate a non is to initiate a non-blocking operation and not to come back and wait for it. And the really important point is a non-blocking operation immediately followed by a matching wait is equivalent to a blocking operation. If you initiate something and then immediately wait for it to finish, you have achieved nothing. Okay, you have to pull them apart and do something in the middle. And non-blocking operations are not the same as sequential operating calls because the operation continues after the call is returned. And that gives us some subtleties. This is one of the few play points, it's, it's one of the few um, uh, parts of MPI where you get subtle race conditions that, you know, if you, uh, and I'll, I'll come back to that. So we separate the communication to three phases. We initiate the non-blocking communication. We do some work perhaps involving other communications in practice, that's the, that's the utility of non-blocking um, communications. And then we wait for the non-blocking communication to complete. You have to do that. And so in some sense, a, a, a non-blocking send is a bit like having um, an out box. It's not a completely perfect analogy, but it's a bit, if I do a blocking send, uh, I'll use, I, for some strange reason, I have my old British passport here. Um, for those of you who've been following the Brexit debate, this, this puts the complete light of the British passports used to be blue. This is a British passport from the 1980s and it's very, very black. Anyway, it's a coincidence. Um, when I do a blocking send, synchronous send, I say, please send this message 
and I wait till it's sent. And if it's never if it's never received, then I wait forever. Uh, Non-blocking is a bit like having an outbox. A bit. I put the message in the outbox, and I say to MPI, "Could you please deliver that? I'll come back later, okay, and check." So non-blocking is a bit like having an outbox. But importantly, I think mean, someone mentioned this yesterday. Um, if you're using synchronous send or non-blocking synchronous send, there is no copy taken, okay? So that means if you, so the, imagine that I had, I was um, important enough to have a secretary, okay? So a non-blocking of you, bit like me saying to my secretary, telling him, look, could you, I, I, I've put my passport there, okay? I, I put a document here, yeah? Could you please uh, go and, and post and, and, and send that away in sometime in the future, okay? And tell me when it's done. If I then later on scribble on the document and change it, okay, without checking whether it's been sent or not, I don't know if the if the document was sent before or after it was changed. And that means that when you initiate a non-blocking operation, let's say a non-blocking send, you have a send buffer. You have to make sure you don't touch that send buffer until you've issued the wait, at which point you know the send is complete. So it's up to you to make sure that you don't alter the contents of a, of a send buffer, which is involved in a non-blocking operation. Otherwise, you get a race condition or a program which is, has non-deterministic behavior, and it's, it, it, it's, it's not the right thing to do. So it is one of the few places in MPI where this concept of sort of race conditions and, uh, it comes into operation. A non-blocking receive is actually very like having an inbox. Uh, a blocking receive is I stand there and wait. I need to see if I can see the camera. A blocking receive is you stand here and wait for something to come in. A non-blocking receive, you say, look, there's the inbox. I'm expecting a message to come in. Put it there when it comes in. I'll go and do something else and come back and check um, whether it's there. Okay. So the syntax. Okay, so we have some handles for non-block communications. They take the same MPI data type or integer, but you get something back. Actually, I'll just, so, I mean, my best analogy for... Um, non-blocking communications is sending a package via a courier okay so if i if i post a letter just through a letterbox i put it in the letterbox and i go away okay if i post a package via a courier okay i go to the courier um so yes if you turn the non-blocking you cannot be changed until you've gone back and checked it if it's been received or more technically check that the communication is completed but yes, that is correct. You have to do the wait. You have to later on say, look, and we'll, we'll come to those functions later. Can you tell me or wait until this has been, you, you initiate the send, you go away, you do some other work, possibly other, you come back and say, look, I can't go any further until that message has been sent because I, I, I want to reuse that buffer and I can't, I can't reuse it until I know the messaging operation has been completed. So I have to wait and say, look, I'm now going to wait until that's finished. Right, it's finished and we're all, we're all good again. Yeah, so you're absolutely right. And also with a non-blocking receive, you cannot read the contents until you've checked that the message has actually come in. Because if you issue a non-blocking receive and then just read the contents without checking that a message has come in, you don't know if you've got the old or the new data. Okay. Uh, is that clear? I hope I explained that. And that actually, that actually is an issue in the example we're going to do. So it can be surprisingly subtle. So I think a good analogy for non-blocking communications is um, is uh, um, sending a parcel via a courier. So if I go to a courier, DHL or your favorite courier, other couriers are available, you give them the parcel and you give them some money, okay? But they give you something back. What do they give you back? You get a receipt and the receipt contains what it's not just a financial receipt you will get a receipt saying yeah thanks for your money but it also a tra absolute a tracking number so the important point is you get a tracking number and that allows you to later on phone them up and say has my parcel been delivered or not and mpi also gives you a tracking number but mpi calls it um, a request so when you issue a non-blocking communication the parameters are the same as before but you get back something called an mpi request which is an integer in Fortran or an object of type MPI request in C, which is your tracking number, your ticket. And you have to remember it. If you have two outstanding non-blocking communications, you've got two tickets. If you forget them, then, you know, 
you've lost your, you know, you'll never be able to check on that. It's up to you to remember these tickets, okay? And then when you do a wait or you say to MPI, you gave me this ticket, could you tell me, could, I, could you wait and tell me when that's completed? So a, a particular request corresponds to a particular send or receive operation, okay? So every communication you initiate has a separate request. You can reuse them once you've done the wait, but you, if, you know, that's the common mistake, okay? And I think the, the um, courier analogy is a good one there. So non-blocking synchronous send is exactly like um, a blocking sync is exactly like blocking synchronous send, except it has a, it's called I send I S send apologies, which is meant to indicate immediate that this returns control to you immediately. Buff count data type des tag com and the request is returned to you. You don't go to the courier and say, could you send this message? And by the way, I'd like it to be uh, tracking number fifty seven. You say, could you send this parcel? And they give you a tracking number, okay? So it's returned to you. And later on, you can wait, MPI wait, and you give it the request and you get back a status. And now I'll come back to the status later on, but not particularly important here. In Fortran, it's just the same, except the request is an integer and then you wait on it. Now, if you issue these two commands, MPI I send and then MPI wait, you have achieved precisely nothing, okay? I cannot, people, you have, but if I do an MPI I said and then immediately wait, you have achieved precisely nothing. The point is though, because they're two separate functions, you can put code in between here to do something useful, like issue a receive, yeah? So there's nothing magic about non-blocking communications. They just give you the ability to do something clever. So an, a non-blocking operation immediately followed by a wait achieves zero addition. In fact, it's more complicated than just doing the blocking operation, but you can pull them apart. Non-blocking receive is, looks just like a normal receive, MPI receive, except it has an I in front, I receive, so it returns immediately. It sets up an inbox and then waits for it to come in. Um, buff count data. So there's the request here, okay? So we, so we get a request, but there's something missing from the receive. When we normal receive, we normally specify something which is missing in this prototype. Can anyone see what's missing? So I've changed up the status. And the reason is the status gives you information on the message which was, which came in. But by definition, when the non-blocking receive returns to you, no message has been received. That's why the status is only filled in by the wait. It's only when you wait and it's complete that it can fill in the status. Now you'll notice that a send request and a receive request are the same type. MPI, so you have a you have a, a ticket which refers to a non-blocking communication. MPI remembers if that's a send or a receive, okay? So the status, if you do a wait on a non-blocking non-blocking send operation, the value of the status is not particularly interesting. Uh, but if you do a wait on a non-blocking receive, it is interesting because it will tell you what message actually came in, okay? So that's really um, that's really the concepts. I'm going to cover some of the, the ramifications of that and some of the details, but that is, you know, that is you, a non-blocking operation. You, you issue it, you get back a, a tracking number, which MPI calls a request, and later on you wait for that to complete. If you issue seven non-blocking receives, each one has to have a different buffer. If you do two non-blocking receives to the same buffer, then who knows what's going to happen. They're going to, so it's up to you to allocate the memory for the buffers, have them all lined up. So you have to do a bit more bookkeeping. Yes, while waiting, nothing is going to be, can you resume working with? Ah, okay, so no, a wait is at, so I'll come back, that's called a test. In MPI, a wait says, do not return control to me and, until this has completed. So while wait just sits, in the, MP, in the MPI wait routine until the messages come in or be delivered and then returns to you. If you want to do something else, that's called a test. So I'll come on to them later. So some people worry about send and receive can be blocking or non-blocking. Okay, a blocking send can be used with a non-blocking receive. It doesn't matter how you initiate it. Once you initiate, um, you know, a, 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 a message, it's just it's just the message, right? So non-blocking says you can use any mode, synchronous, buffered, or standard, okay? Now, actually, um, you never do non-blocking buffered sends because the point about non-blocking sends is they, they allow you to break the deadlock, okay? Buffered send breaks that in a different way by having an explicit copy. So they're there for completeness, but, you know, 
we're going to program with start with synchronous send, okay? And therefore, to break the deadlock, you have to use non-blocking synchronous send, IS send. So the communication operations are uh, synchronous send, MPI, IS send, buffered send, it exists, you can never use it. MPI I send you need because although MPI because MPI send might be synchronous. So to do MPI send safely in many cases to avoid deadlock, you have to use an MPI I send. But for this course, we'll use MPI IS send because that means if you get it wrong, the program deadlocks. Okay, so that's what we want. We want to program, want to write correct programs. So in this course, MPI IS send and use MPI receive. I receive apologies. Non-blocking synchronous send. Non-blocking receive. So as well as waiting, this is, I hope, answers Laurent's question, you can test. MPI test says, here's a request, could you tell me yes, no, true, false, if it's completed, okay? So when you do a test, you get back a flag, which in Fortran is a proper Boolean, and C it will be a naught one. And if flag is uh, one, the, the operation has completed, and the status will be um, valid. If flag is zero, then it just says it hasn't completed. Hopefully that's what Laurent means. You can say, could you tell me if it's completed? It hasn't. Okay, I'll do, go and do something else. So this is, um, yeah. So, so, so MPI calls that test rather than wait. A wait is effectively a continuous test. You should never do a, a loop on test. You should call wait. But if you want to check if something is, uh, a test is a check, a wait is a continuous test in some sense. Here's an example, it's a very contrived example. I just wanted to, um... no, so Lee, that's a good point. No, if test gives one, it's exactly the same as having called wait. So no, if test gives one, you don't have to call wait. That's a very good point. Once it's returned to, so, so uh, issuing a test which returns true is exactly the same as having issued a wait. It's a good question. So, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to send a message from rank zero to rank one. And somewhat bizarrely, I'm going, rather than using synchronous send, I'm going to use MPI ISN, but it's purely for, for to illustrate. So for example, I have an MPI request request, an MPI status status, okay? If rank is zero, I want to send the send array, which is 10 integers, to process one. MPI COM1, but because it's a non-blocking synchronous send, I get back, so I, I've initiated. So this will return immediately, okay? This will return immediately. And then I call a routine called do something else while ISN happens. And then I, once that's done, I wait for the send to complete MPI wait request status, okay? On the receive side, if rank equals one, I do an MPI receive, okay? Um, MPI receive, um, receive rate 10 uh, integers from zero, tag com. I, I set it up, I then call a routine, do something else while I receive happens, and then I do a wait. So that's just to illustrate the syntax, okay, of how it works. Now, the this request, yeah, refers to the send, yeah? Okay. This request, Reserved to the receive. Uh, re some people think the request refers to the end to end. There is no there there is no end to endness in MPI. You know, this is testing that the send has completed. This is testing that the receive has completed. Okay, then it's not testing that the overall. Now that means we have two requests. We have a send request and a receive request. Yeah, but we appear to only find one request. So why does this work? I'm saying we need to actually have what well, runtime, we have two requests here. We have the send request and we have the receive request. I've called them both requests, but they're being used in different ways. Yeah. Yes, exactly. The local to the process. So when I do MPI request request, when I run this on two processes, you actually have two requests. Okay. Each process have its own request. So I'm 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 that so so that is really important. This wait is referring to this request here. This wait refers to this one. No. So the data is not safe to a buffer in IS, and if it were, then you could alter it, okay? So yeah, well, there's, so the only difference to buffered send is that in the latter case, I don't get a confirmation. Yes, so, so to the user, um, so there's two differences. One is you don't get a confirmation, 
but two, you 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 don't have the subtlety with buffered send of having to worry about altering the buffer. But you're right, functionally, the only difference to buffer send is that I, in the latter case I don't get a confirmation. But we tend not to use buffer send in MPI because it's ugly and horrible. And so so you're absolutely right. The only difference to buffer send is that in the latter case, but it's slightly more complicated. But it is the way you should program. Um, yes, that's a good a good point. Fortran is just the same, except it's an integer request, and it's uh, the state. So it's exactly the same here. I won't go through that. It's exactly the same code. So you could actually have um, you can actually test or wait for completion of one message. Okay, you can have multiple communications at once. Uh, I don't know what you mean by a sign request. No, this the request. If you look at the C version, MPI. MPI, it's like you're saying to the, to the courier, you're giving a blank piece of paper. You know, could you write the ticket number on this blank piece of paper? So MPI is filling in the request. You know, so it's MPI that's assigning some meaning to the request. Does that make sense? So so you just declare it's like a blank piece of paper. You give it to MPI. That's why you pass a. Um, that's why you pass the the um, the pointer to request because MPI is is going to initiate is is going to initialize it. So it's like saying you're not telling the courier, please make this communication 57. The courier, you give the courier a piece because you're right and it scribbles on them. Yeah. You can have multiple communications, okay? So you might have 10 requests and you might say, well, I want to wait for one of them to complete. I want to wait for all of them to complete. I might want to wait for some of them to complete. So this is in the um, in the controller worker task farm example, what I could do is rather than having one um, MPI received with MPI any source, I could have, if I had 10 workers, I could set up 10 inboxes, non-blocking receives, and I could say I've got these non-blocking receives waiting for any of your incoming messages. And I might say, could you tell me if one of them is completed? Could you tell me how many have completed or could you wait till they've all completed? So MPI calls that. So it's like having multiple inboxes. How do you test these? Well, you might you have an array of requests. So you have to stick the request into a little array. And you can then say um, that's this slide is. OK, so I haven't given the, the syntax here, uh, but it's called MPI test. Um, <coughs> test any. Or MPI wait any tests or waits for, for 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 one of these to finish. MPI tests some or MPI wait some waits for some of them to complete. And MPI test all or MPI wait all waits for them all to complete. Now the reason I don't have the, the you can imagine that for MPI test some, the syntax gets very verbose. You have to provide an array of requests, an array of flags, and MPI will say you know you get an array of zeros and ones saying which ones have finished. And that's why I don't have the the syntax here, but that their MPI test any, test some, or test all, or wait any, wait some, wait all. Okay, so, um, so, so, but you can, there is that generality. Now, there is a routine called send receive, and I mention it here just because of um, MPI send receive. So, the problem, <clears throat> the reason we get problems with um, um, deadlock is that if we issue the send first, we can't issue the receive. If we issue the receive first, we can't, we never get to the send. Now, MPI send receive says, look, you're issuing the send and the receive at the same time. So you can break the deadlock in that way, okay? So the, the, the prototype is very simple. You just give all the, all the send up uh, parameters and the receive correct parameters into one big horrible routine. So you have send buff, send count, send type, dest, send tag, receive buff, receive count, receive type, source, receive tag, com status, okay? So it's just all the param. And so MPI will break the deadlock because it will guarantee that these will be issued in some sense simultaneously. So for this particular pattern we're doing, the message around a ring, you could use send receive. However, learning send receive is a bit of a dead end because it doesn't generalize. Non-blocking generalizes to much more complicated multi-dimensional non-structured non cases. So you should learn to use I 
the, the non-blocking IS send and I receive routines. You will people see people using send receive. Um, if you looked at the, the implementation of send receive in the library, it probably just does a non-blocking send and non-blocking receive and waits for them both to complete. I mean, it's not magic, but so it is. It is can be useful, but I don't recommend using it because it is a bit of a dead end. It does not generalize to more complicated patterns. So although you see it used a lot, it's a bit of a shortcut, and that's why I don't. You you, you can use it for this pair for this message rendering if you want. I think it's one of the exercises, but it's actually much more useful to learn non-blocking send and non-blocking receive. So the exercise is to absolutely. So that's a very important point that Lee's made here. Is it true that in buffered send, I can overwrite the data straight after send, but in IS send, I can only do that after getting confirmation? Yes. Yeah. You can only overwrite the buffer when the send operation is complete. So a blocking send operation is complete as soon as it returns. So yes, when B send returns, the operation is complete, you can overwrite the buffer. A non-blocking operation, you have to wait for confirmation. So absolutely right. In buffered send, I can overwrite the data straight after after it returns to you, but in IS send, I can only do that after I get confirmation. So that, that's absolutely, that kind of encapsulates exactly um, the point. So the example we're going to do is message around a ring. So IB, right, so, okay, so this is it, so. IB send, there's no reason ever to use IB send, okay? But technically, um, when B send returns, okay, what do you know has happened? What is guaranteed has happened? It's not guaranteed the data has been sent, but something has happened. So when, when a normal B send, a blocking B send, the data is in the buffer, it's been copied, yeah. So in principle, IB send could return control to you before the data has been copied to the buffer, in principle. Now, I bet it doesn't, but there is no reason ever to use IB send because by using B send, you have broken any deadlock by, by mandating that MPI takes a copy. So it's there for completeness, um, for um, uh, obsessive hand washing reasons, but, um, so you're right. Absolutely. Technically, for IB send, you cannot overwrite the buffer until you've done the, the wait. But there is no look, fun, MPI test. Any. So MPI test any will return when one of the communications is completed. MPI test some will try and say, might say, oh, three of them have completed and these are the ones that completed. So MPI test any will only will, will say this is the communication that finished and only one of them. So, so an MPI test any can only notify you completion of one. MPI test sum will say, actually, these three have all completed. If you do MPI test any, it would just tell, would tell you one of them. You'd have to call it three times. Does that make sense? I should maybe put a slide in because it's not as um, clear as I. Yes. So let's look at the, the it, that's exactly right. So actually, so if you're, given you're interested, I think it'd be useful to actually, um, to actually do this. Um, just do, it was MPI test any you were interested in, wasn't it? So MPI test any, well, I don't, oh yes, it's all one word, test any. Um, so, so you give it an, an array of requests, a flag and a status, and the index that comes back tells you uh, which one has completed, okay? Index the operator has completed, so it's only returning you one, yeah? But if I do MPI test sum, uh, um, I don't know why that, MPI test sum, um, if you, you give uh, how, you have to tell like how many there are. You give an array of requests. Um, you get an out count, which tells you how many there were, and you get an array of indices and a, an array of statuses. So you know it, you 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 get back um, a number saying three completed, and then it will give you a little array of which ones completed, and then for each of those you get a status. So it's 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 slightly um, and of course the out the the arrays of indices and the statuses have to be big enough to accommodate potentially all of the has to be as big as in count because they could all have completed so yeah, that was a good question i should maybe put some slides in about that does that answer your question 
yeah, so so it's the prototype gets slightly convoluted. I've not used these in anger actually ever, but um, so the exercise, um, I will just briefly um, slightly verbose. So we've only got quor so um, I'll. I'll So uh, what I normally do is, uh, if I make this a bit bigger, is I do this as an exercise. I get people to actually stand um, and pass. I should make if I, I should make a video of people doing it, which would be a good thing to do. But I haven't had time to do that. Of people actually passing, um, I get them to write their age on a piece of paper, and we pass it around. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a global sum here, but we're going to do a global sum by passing data around in a ring. Okay, so everyone. Right, and so each each process right initializes some data, and then they pass um, they pass that to their neighbor, and they receive from, the, from their previous neighbor. So the data goes around it. Now, the processes don't have an age, so we just use our rank. So so you have some data, which is a message. Okay, you pass it round in a ring, and if you do it n times, you've seen everybody's. Uh, everybody's um, data and you add it up as it comes in. Okay, does that make sense? Maybe you need to think about it. But you're passing data around in a ring and you, it comes in, you add it to your running total and you pass it on again. Okay, so you maybe need to, to have a, so that's what we're going to do and this, it's explained here how to do it. This is a specific example for four processes, but you should write a program which works for any number of processes. It's just to draw it. I find it easiest to draw it for four. And there are a number of ways of doing this, okay? So I'll have to share a different screen again. Um, that um, there is a, um, so the, the, if everyone does, so we're gonna program with synchronous send and, and, and receive, okay? If everyone does synchronous send to the right, they never get to the receive to the left. If everyone does receive to the left, they never do the synchronous send to the right. So what you can do is you do a non-blocking send to your forward neighbor. Just check, I'll get my camera. So you do a non-blocking send to your forward neighbor and say, look, that's my data. Could you send it off? Then you can turn around and do a blocking send from your backward neighbor. That completes because it matches their ongoing, their ongoing non-blocking send. So you, so you get the message. Then you turn around and you, you have to wait for that to complete and then you can carry on. You can do it the other way. You can say, okay, I'm expecting a message from this guy. When it comes in, could you put it there, right? Then you can issue a blocking synchronous send to your neighbor and theirs comes in. Then that will match their outstanding non-blocking receive. Then you can turn around and wait for the data to come in. Then you can complete. Or actually, you can do both. You can say, look, I want data to go that way, data to come in that way. Just tell me when it's all over, please. So you issue a non-blocking send to the right a non-blocking receive to the left, and you say, could you wait for them both to complete? Um, so, no, it's not true. You always have to test or wait. Now, um, the, 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 um, it is possible, it is possible to write programs where, so for example, imagine you've got somebody sending you explicit acknowledgement. I issue them a non-blocking send, okay? They receive it, then they send a message back to me. Okay, well, I'm coming to that, okay? Once they receive it, then how do you know it's been received, okay? How do you know the neighbor's received it? You don't know the neighbor's received it unless you do the wait. No, but that, that means that their that their send is completed to you, but it doesn't mean that your send, unless there's only two processes, okay? It doesn't mean that your send is completed to the neighbor, okay? Your blocking receive returns when, that means that when your blocking receive returns, it means that their send is completed, but it's not, you don't know that yours is completed. Does that make sense? You still don't know if your message, which was going that way, has been received. But you don't know that it's been completed. How do you know? How do you know if, if your neighbors that? So yes. So if, if I if I, I issue a non-blocking send to the right, yeah. So I say, please send that message to my neighbor there. Okay. Let's think there's more than two processes. Okay. Let's send that neighbor there, right? Then I do a blocking send to the left. It completes. I, that means that their send is completed. Okay. 
But I still don't know if that sentence is completed because this guy might have gone to sleep. How do I know? Okay, I have to wait for that to complete so I know it's been received. If that makes sense. Now, if we only had two processes, okay, then um, you could you can write programs where um, where, where where actually you know a communication is completed without doing the test or the wait. Because, because if you ask for an explicit receipt, yeah? So example, if I send a message by a courier to my auntie, yeah? And then she phones me up and says, I received your, I received your package. I know that, that that has completed without doing, without phoning the courier company. However, you have to do the test or the wait. Because if you don't do the test or the wait, MPI doesn't know that you finished with the communication and it, it will end up having to remember it can only release that request get rid of it when you have done a test or a wait if you don't do a test or a wait you can have it's the equivalent of a memory leak mpi ends up having to remember millions of, of requests and then what actually happens is your program grinds to a halt or falls over so every non-blocking communication has to have a test or wait even if you know the communication is completed yourself you need to tell mpi look you know, could you it's a bit subtle but if you don't test for the completion of non-blocking communications, you have the equivalent of a memory leak. And I have seen MPI programs which linearly slow down. They get slow because if MPI has having to remember millions of requests, every time you do it await, it's it all it's got it has to do vast amounts of work and it will eventually fall over. It will say, Look, I've got a million I've had to remember a million requests. You know, I can't I can't do it. Does that make sense? OK, that's a very good question. So um, notes, your neighbors don't change. Some people think on it. So they're in the diagram. There are there are they're, they're, on iteration one. You, you do the iteration four times so that the data goes around the room. On each iteration, you send. I'm going to do here left. You send to the left, receive from the right, send to the left, receive from the right. Your neighbors don't change. On iteration one, you don't send to process one iteration two. You, yeah, so you can do n minus one times. So yes, that you can do n or n minus one. So 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 I say initialize to zero and do it n times. You can save an iteration by iteration by doing n minus one times. Uh, is there a simple way to wrap between first and last? Part? So so you are going to have to complete your you you are going to have to compute your neighbors, yeah. So you're going to have to say neighbor up is rank plus one, neighbor one is rank minus one, and then you're going to have to cope with the fact that um, if your if your rank is zero, it's not minus one, it's it's it, it's it's n minus one, and if you're so there is a trick for doing that, um, to do that. Um, um, you do not alter the data you receive. You receive it, you add it to your running total, and you pass the data unchanged along the ring. You don't pass your running total on. You don't keep passing on your rank. You receive, I'm doing receive from the rank. You receive, you receive some, all this works better if I can have people in the classroom doing the physical exercise. You receive some data, you add it to your running total, and you pass that data on unchanged, okay? And you must not access send or receive buffers until communications are complete. You cannot read from a receive buffer until after wait on I receive. You cannot overwrite a send buffer until I wait on I send. So those are, that, those are useful notes to, um, to, 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 to um, the trick for doing the wrapping is um, to to do. I'll just share my screen. Um, the trick, if you can see it, is uh, you do up rank equals rank plus one, down rank equals rank minus one. But yes, so that you in C you do rank plus one percent size, and you'd like to do rank minus one percent size, but C is stupid and it gets it wrong, so you have to do rank minus one plus size. So that's the trick. Or in Fortran, I think Fortran actually gets it right, but uh, I'll still, Semicolons at the end. I think Fortran, Fortran has a proper, Fortran gets it right, but I always. Um, it 
or you can just do you can do if you know you can say up rank is rank plus one down rank is rank minus one if rank equals zero then down rank equals size minus one if rank equals size minus one then up rank equals zero i mean it's up to you but this is just a bit of a shortcut okay um, 